welcome everyone um, to tonight's presentation on aeroponics. Um, this is presented by Marea, Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association. We are an all-volunteer nonprofit organization dedicated to providing educational topics such as tonight's uh, on renewable energy and sustainable living. Um, coming up uh, May 31st, we'll have a presentation on advances in solar technology. Um, in June, uh, another presentation on backyard composting. And then in July, we're going to learn about integrating renewables into the grid. Um, you can learn more about these and some other upcoming uh, Marea events at the Marea.org. Um, all right, Phil. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, tonight, we're presenting Integrating Technologies for Energy and Food Security. And this is uh, about how Adragon, Ad, Ad, Adragon, Adragon, okay. Adragon. <laughs> Adragon, which is obviously about your baby dragons, right? Right. <laughs> okay. It's Adragon that was, aeroponics, that's all the way from where we started to where we are now. Okay, great. So we're using, you're using homegrown solutions that can work around the world. So we're, we're pleased to have tonight with us uh, Jody Spangler, uh, CEO of Adragon. Adragon Aeroponics and uh, Executive Board of Solar Cities, and also Janice Kelsey, who's the Executive Director of Solar Cities, which is Connecting Community Catalyst Integrating Technologies. That's quite a quite a word there. So I'll start with Jody, and and she'll uh, get you over to Janice. And she's having trouble finding her video. Anyway, we. Um... We have a very, very different uh, type of growing here, which we grow vertically, but it's sort of a hybrid vertical farming. We don't use flat trays. Um, we actually grow on the side of a wall. And if I could get my video up, if anybody knows how to do it on the iPad, it would be great. Um, I could show you what we're growing. I have doors full of lettuces and uh, all kind of herbs and things like that right now. So basically we use um, the same water in a trough at the bottom of the wall, and then it's pumped to the top. It cascades over the back of each individual pot in a wall of 720 plants in 10, 10 foot long space, but it's uh, seven feet high. And we um, don't use the, like, we don't have a lot of root system because our planting medium holds enough water, the roots don't have to search out water during the dry season as between waterings. So they stay very compact and I can take them in and out of the wall to move them around if I need to move. Uh, so I wanna empty a door to make room for more planting, I can do that. So we actually use one tenth of the amount of water that they use in any other form of vertical or hydroponic farming. So we're saving on water. We run on solar energy because all of our pumps are only 60 watt or 60, um, yeah, 60 watt pumps. The same with our grow lights, which are very specifically designed to grow maximum plant in minimum space with lights. And again, if I could get this video up, I would show you them. Yes, well, I, I did, I added some more pictures, Jody, to the presentation. So I've got okay. some updated ones that I can show them. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. So we're, we're saving space by going vertical because we go seven feet in the air. Um, I, I have about a half acre truck patch inside two shipping containers, 40 foot by eight foot wide shipping containers. I have an almost capacity for almost 5,000 plants in that small space. So, and it's enclosed. So we have a solar run uh, system that cools in the summer and heats in the winter. And that way we're saving on electricity because again, it's run by solar. So we're saving water, electricity, space, and we're maximizing our nutrition on our lettuces. So at this point, we also have um, a scientist, Joel Clapperton, who is working on micronutrients so that we could literally put in three to four drops of any particular nutrient that the plant needs and save, again, save our uh, earth minerals. So we, we think 
eventually we can use our fertilizer from the biodigester inside the walls with added nutrient that it needs to grow 100% better food localized in communities. So that's sort of our, our goal of getting this out to the world. And that's pretty much what I have without showing you video. <laughs> Thank you, Jody. You're welcome. You, you ready to start, Janice? I am. Okay, the history of, of, of Jody and I and, and the whole solar cities and hydroponics, Adragon aeroponics started um, way back when we got into vertical aeroponics and we were very, very interested in it. We, we met a National Geographic Explorer, university professor, and we ended up getting together and starting this nonprofit organization um, because we basically wanted to somehow replace or at least um, cut down on the minerals that um, we've been using uh, mining from the earth. And we wanted to see if we could use the biodigestate as the primary so source and then just add nutrients to that. So what we're talking about here, as you know, is integrating technologies for energy and uh, food security. Um, the food growing system that Jody was talking about would include the biodigestion, the vertical aeroponics, these innovative LED lighting that we're, we're now starting to use, and um, the antimicrobial wall coating that uh, lines Jody's greenhouse. She has a shipping container greenhouse. Um, let me move along here. Um, Microscale biodigestion. Um, it's a worldwide movement. Um, what we're seeing now is um, it started years ago with T.H. Colhane's um, uh, Facebook group called Solar Cities Biogas Innoventors and Practitioners. Um, it has become quite the movement. You'll find other uh, Facebook groups that say biogas, but they really all started out with this original um, group that uh, Professor Colhane started. Um, we have members globally. Um, a lot of the members are now developing these DIY and commercial systems. We teach the uh, IBC tank system that you'll see a, a picture of coming up. Um, members have been working and sharing together in a very non-competitive way because we're addressing issues such as poverty, um, health uh, from, uh, you know, uh, open fire cooking, um, deforestation, mudslides, environment, and, um, and a need for local economies. Um, <clears throat> we used to call it a wet waste to energy program, and now the United Nations is actually calling waste consumption and production residuals to energy. So that's a whole talk in itself. Um, let me get to the next slide here. So a lot of you probably already know about biodigestion, um, and I know you're familiar with composting. Composting uses air. We uh, layer things like um, manure and straw and garden waste, and we turn it to get the aerobic microbes um, digesting what we have in there. Um, what we're doing is anaerobic. We actually create a closed environment with no air. It's basically a tank of water with manure in it, and we, we start it, we inoculate it with, um, you know, fresh, you know, uh, microbes. And uh, it's a closed system, very much like the stomach. It, uh, it has a gut, you know, like ours. It has the same microbes that you have in your gut that a cow or a horse has as well. So what we have learned over the years of doing this is that um, biodigestion, small-scale biodigestion, if we're doing this at a community level, an individual level, this is actually addressing all 17 of the UN's sustainable development goals um, in some way, shape, or form. So I won't go through every single one of them. I'm sure many of you are already uh, very familiar with the sustainable development goals. I can always share this presentation with you um, as a file. Um, but the, you know, we're focusing on you know, no more poverty. So we're reducing the need to purchase charcoal, um, we're producing clean, free cooking fuel, and uh, people can also sell their extra fuel or sell their extra fertilizer. Um, we're, uh, we're growing nutrient-dense, we're creating nutrient-dense fertilizer that's regenerating soil. It's increasing crop yields, which is what Jody has experienced, and she can share that with you later. And we're providing more food for families and, lot, and livestock. Um, 
cooking on biogas eliminates indoor air pollution. It's, uh, you know, it's causing serious illnesses. Um, it's a whole education program. This is practical curriculum. A practical curriculum offers valuable life skills, vocational skills. It addresses both immediate and future needs. Um, gender equality, uh, we have greater safety. Um, we, we speak directly with families in um, remote areas like uh, in Nepal or, or Africa and Haiti. So we have discussed this very, uh, very thoroughly with them. Um, we, uh, when women are, um, women and children are gathering wood, it is, a, it is an important social time for them. But um, it, it, in some areas, it's, it's too much. Um, they need to be relieved of this and they'll have more time for studies and less shame, shame of open defecation because we can create these biogas toilets as well. Um, we have um, human and animal manure are perceived as valuable when we're talking about biodigestion. We talk about poop and food waste. Um, I use the word poop because we're talking about human poop and animal poop. Um, we're containing our pathogens. Um, we call ourselves solar cities because we are using solar energy uh, to create this. We're using the last vestiges of solar energy. So energy, we're making energy from waste. It reduces, again, the need to purchase charcoal. Um, we have extra fuel and fertilizer, again, can be used as a revenue stream. Um, infrastructure, uh, emerging industry brings new skills using locally sourced materials, inspires innovation. Like I said, uh, we have people who are now developing small businesses around the world and in, in remote places, in cities, um, in rural areas, um, peace, uh, reduced inequalities. Um, people across all socioeconomic spectrum achieve energy independence, sustainable waste management and food security. Um, Rich or poor, we all have these energy producing residuals. We all have poop and food waste. That's a fact. Um, sustainable cities and communities, uh, food waste is managed at its source and never reaches a landfill. Um, responsible consumption and production, consumers and producers eliminate food waste from their homes, restaurants, schools, and businesses. It can be used anywhere. Uh, it's scalable. Uh, climate action, we're reducing methane emissions and fossil fuel use. Um, biogas is carbon neutral when burned. We can actually burn it inside. Um, we can burn a biogas stove inside a greenhouse to uh, actually add uh, what we need in the greenhouse. Um, life below water, dealing with waste at its source through on-site microscale biodigestion pre pre prevents animal and human manure from going into waterways. Um, one of the things that helps Jody on her small farm is that uh, she has cows and her manure management plan is much simpler than most people because she puts all of her manure into a biodigester and it comes out basically a, almost a clear liquid. Um, <clears throat> on land, we're, uh, we're preventing deforestation, reducing soil erosion, reducing deadly landslides. Um, forests have a chance to regrow. Fertilizer regenerates soil, reduces the accumulation of or organic waste in landfills. Um, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Peace through access to free fuel and free fertilizer to grow one's own food. Food and fuel, these are key. 17, uh, we partner with other nonprofit organizations, corporations, government agencies, educational institutions, food producers, research and development companies. We, we partner with anybody who's interested in partnering. Um, we, we've had folks from Villanova and Penn State and a no number of different universities. And we have, as I said, we have a research project, a USDA grant project in the backyard to develop a residential scale biodigester, thermally controlled biodigester. So one of our, our key plans was to create biogas education hubs. We look at biogas as the, the literally the hub of a wheel and everything expands out from there, including what we're doing in the greenhouse. So there is TH Colhane. He's down, he's based down in Florida. He's at uh, Rosebud Continuum where we have a biogas education hub there. So that's a home where people can go to Florida and learn. We have one in in my backyard and Jody's backyard. We 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 coexist because she's a mile away. That's my biodigester right there. It's two, two IBC tanks together, which is just perfect for me. I have a number of other biodigesters out back now. And this is what I bring into my home. 
So you can see this is clean burning fuel. It's a, it's a clean blue flame. And I get this just from food waste. Now we originally inoculated it with manure, but this is all just food waste. We have a uh, biogas education hub in uh, New York State, Kathy Puffer. She was one of our original board members. She has now started an online um, education course um, called the Biogas Education Hub, where people can now go on and take a 10-week program. We have one, what we find most important is to get these hubs in other places. Um, this is Boma Mohammed G, and he is in Cameroon, and he has started an incredible um, experimental farm there where he teaches on the farm, but he also goes around um, the country and teaches as well in remote locations. He's a, an expert in the larger brick and mortar biodigesters. He's, he's an artist. Um, this is uh, Isabel Galliano and Hattie Charles, and they started a biogas education <laughs> hub in Harry's home country of Tanzania. So they're doing the same thing. They're offering service, but they're also teaching. <laughs> Um, we have one at Maya Mountain Research Farm in Belize. Look at that. They took IBC tanks and carried them in on, on a, a raft. That's how important that was to them. And they are all about saving the rainforest, um, preserving medicines. And, uh, you know, it just a, a hub of a wheel. It just goes out into other things. So um, some of our current biogas projects. Um, right now, the University of Notre Dame de Haiti uh, they are actually have developed a, a college course. It's now a full year course in the Department of Nursing and Public Health. And they're going out also into the community and teaching and, uh, and that's creating more and more um, little education sites. Um, we are now friends with His Excellency Dili um, Chaudhary. He is the founding president of uh, BASE Nepal um, this is an organization that um, he started when he was very young. It's an organization that helps the Taru people who were not freed of slavery until 1950. And they really didn't recognize their rights until 2000. Um, so his interest is for us to go and do a program at his cultural center um, in the Taru region so that um, other people in the area can come there. And that would also be a biogas education hub. Um, we're now working um, with our friend Patience in Rwanda. He is working at the, um, he's, he's working to protect the mountain gorilla and he wants this to be part of the uh, Volcanoes National Park. He's actually starting to build and we're doing a lot of stuff online with him. Our latest and greatest, which is great because we have several sites that we want to go to in uh, Kenya. Uh, this is uh, Marceline and Musa. They have started, they are refugees in a refugee camp, Kak Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And they have started a small nonprofit organization. They're all volunteer and uh, they teach permaculture. So what they want to do is they want to add biodigestion to their permaculture course and uh, make that basically the center of what they're doing. Uh, and then they will share out from there. They, they love teaching and they're, they're part of the um, uh, million plant, plant a Million Trees project. Um, so as Jody and I were moving along in this and, and Dr. Colhane, um, we we're, were talking about closing the agricultural loop. So we're going from, um, you know, if you start with biodigestion and you're taking your food waste and you're creating both energy and fertilizer, then you can have the fertilizer to feed your aeroponics or your hydroponics. We like the aeroponics um, because it's, still, it's much less water. It's much less space to use. Um, and we get our fresh greens or our fresh veggies from there, fresh herbs. And then we circle right back around to food again and whatever we have left, our residuals comes right back to the biodigester. So we're closing that loop and we can do that at scale. So here we go to the vertical aeroponic grow walls. So uh, it was Jody's idea to take some shipping containers. We had a, a, our friend Lee Stoltz was specialized in closed cell soy based foam. Um, we have, um, I think you can see me. In my picture, I have a piece here. It's very thick. Her, her greenhouse is sealed with that foam and it's all insulated. So here is one picture. There's Jody. Yay! 
So there's a wall that you see there. Um, these walls are, it says here, engineered by actual growers. It, it was actually Jody, Jody and I sharing ideas with some designers who wanted to, you know, do these walls. And uh, so we all teamed up together to, to produce these walls. Um, we're increasing nutrient density of plants. Um, we're producing perpetual harvest. Jody has lettuces that um, she doesn't pick them whole. She actually will pick around those plants and those plants will continue to grow. And we're finding that we're extending the lives of those plants and we have healthier plants and we have, they taste good. They don't taste bitter. And even when they bolt, they're not so bad, but we do finally pull them out. Um, so we've got a very small area. So the aeroponic grow walls, um, they're low wattage. We can, we can use AC or DC. Um, you can probably get the impression that we want to do this stuff all over the world. So we want to be able to offer options to different people. If you're using it here in the U.S., it's one thing. If you're using it in Tunisia, it's a different thing. Low water usage. We, uh, like Jody said, we can grow up to 70, 720 plants per large wall system. We can grow up to 96 plants in a small, small home grow wall system. You can have one-sided walls. You can have two-sided walls. You have options. Um, you can start seeds right in the wall. The, the grow medium, what we wanted to do was go for an organic grow medium, medium and Jody will speak more on that after. Just ask her what she's using. Um, we, um, it integrates perfectly with a biodigester. The systems we're looking at doing would include a biodigester um, inside the... Um, inside the shipping container and where you would be able to put your grow, your residuals from your um, farming into that and then produce uh, both um, heat and, um, and gas. Um, the grow walls are manufactured in the U.S. and we have successfully proven to grow a variety of produce. I won't go through all of these, but here are the lists. Some grow vegetables, grow herbs, um, here are some pictures. So you can see the grow walls there. I added some extra pictures in so you could get a good idea of these walls. What you're looking at right now are the prototypes. I have some of the new ones will come up later. There's some parsley and some sorrel and some chard. There is Jody's granddaughter. So this is a family business that Jody has. It's a family farm. Her grandchildren all help her out in the greenhouse. Um, this, the one you see right now is actually on a table at uh, Jill Clapperton's laboratory in uh, Boston. And she's doing growing research with that. And it's, it's a, I just talked to her. I had a meeting with her at five o'clock. So if I'm a little rattled, I'm, I'm very tired. Um, she, uh, she's just blown away by how much produce it's, it's growing. Um, we had originally started with um, hand cut prototypes. And finally we have this modular system uh, that the manufacturers have come out with. Um, so you can see this one is tall and narrow. So we've got different sizes. Um, the new designs that we have um, offers better water flow, low water and energy usage. Um, you know, we have to consider remote places, um, you know, that maybe don't have a lot of water like Jordan, Tunisia, those are places that we're working in. Um, and if you can see up close, um, and you will in another picture maybe, these are modular, so you can actually have like a, a wide range of sizes and shapes and heights and widths. So there's a picture of Jody standing next to one of the walls, and I think on there you can probably see that it's very modular. Each door has um, three, six, nine, twelve pieces to it. And again, that can be one wall, one-sided, two-sided. Um, there's an example of that leaf that my hand is next to. That was one week's growth after a first cutting. That's a lot of growth. So it's, um, again, it's energy efficient. It's year round, less water, less space, clean, no weeding. This is for urban or rural settings um, out here on the farm. Jody can make uh, money all, all year long selling produce in the winter time. So the lighting that we're going with, um, we've been testing a number of different lights. Um, there's now what we're using is a better grow light. And again, be based on our needs in this shipping container farm, they have designed these lights, the ones on the left for us, that's a 360 degree light. There's also a 180, which Jody just had installed in her greenhouse. 
Um, but you can see the comparison. We had a light on the right that we were using that we were quite happy with, but the one on the left is doing even better. So it's all about, you know, innovation is all about, you know, improvements and change. So we're, we're all, all welcome to that. Um, reflectivity. Um, if you'll see in this picture here, I'll go back to that picture, you'll see the walls are silver, or at least they look silver. They're actually painted white and they have a silver coating on them. So they have a, um, something called Polyguard Silver FP coating by Andec. It was actually developed for us for this greenhouse and was gifted to us by the, the inventor. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a patented formula. It includes silver and exploded glass. Um, it becomes a mechanical rather than a chemical pesticide for microbes because it has that uh, exploded glass in it. It inhibits the growth of mold and algae. That has just blown our minds. We have not had to clean the walls and, and, uh, since the beginning. Um, it also in tests has proven to kill dangerous bacteria at a ratio of 100% for E. coli and staph. And we have those tests if anybody wants to review them. So um, integrating technologies for efficient and affordable food growing systems. So when we're integrating these systems, we can put them inside just about anything. We have, Jody has a shipping container farm. We are working with Green Magic Homes, who has created an agro tunnel that they are putting our walls in. Um, and you, we have a gentleman in New Jersey, in Atlantic City. Um, he's, he's buying a building and putting these uh, grow walls. The city is actually funding the project and they're gonna be putting these grow walls and lighting in, um, in a building in Atlantic City as part of their, uh, uh, what do you call it? When you restore the city. Yeah. Um, so uh, Jody and I had worked in refugee re rescue and resettlement. That's a longer story. But um, one of the things we saw was we really needed to um, address um, poverty and mass migration. And how, did, how would we do that with Dr. Colhane and Solar Cities and Grow Walls and all that fun stuff? Um, so um, we had, Jody and I had actually been invited by the King and Queen of Jordan um, and unfortunately, um, this, the war in Syria happened and it wasn't really safe for us to go. Um, but Dr. Colhane was able to get in there um, and teach a course outside of the Za'atari refugee camp, which is the largest refugee camp um, in Jordan. And then they were able to share their skills within the, the camp. Um, one of the projects we're going to be, we are working on and, and giving them proposals for and uh, it's uh, going to be happening soon is uh, you've probably heard of the, of the village of Tatooine in Star Wars. Um, well, this area where Star Wars had filmed, there's a, an abandoned city and they're going to be actually they're bringing they're repatriating people and bringing them back to this city of Tunisia and the whole city of, uh, of this whole city in, of Dure, Tatooine is going to be an agricultural education center. They're going to bring in all kinds of uh, technology and they, we were telling them what we could offer them and they, and they said, we want it all. So one of those is you can see there's a little, there's a cave. That's actually a, a you know, mock-up of a cave where you have taller walls, shorter walls, lights. Um, and you can see in actuality what a part of the village looks like in that right photo there. Um, so they're taking these old caves and actually converting them into grow areas. And they will have a traditional greenhouse and traditional farming, you know, as well. Um, Jody and I have supported a school in Kenya. When we do go to Kenya, that will also be part of what we support. And a small village of Kisi in Kenya, um, where you know, there's an example. This is my friend's my friend's mother, actually, who uh, you know, she still lives in a mud hut and cooks inside, and you know, she coughs all the time. Um, next steps in innovation and education. This is not the actual design, but we're working with um, one of the laboratories in this country. We're working with advanced cooling technologies in Lancaster. And this is the project that we have in the backyard right now. And it's a thermally controlled biodigester. So what we're trying to do is um, actually create a product that um, you can either drop down in your backyard or that it can fit in your basement. Um, we do have basement biodigesters. Um, Kathy Puffer has hers up in New York and uh, she grinds her food waste from her kitchen sink. She valves it down into her biodigester, 
her biodigester digests it, and then the gas comes back upstairs to her little biogas stove that sits on top of her regular stove that she hasn't used in years. Um, we are, and we're, we're looking for assistance on this too, we're developing a biogas curriculum for the New York City School District. Um, this will start in New York City, it will be tested in New York City, and then it will be adapted to any city or school or program or country that um, wants to use it. And we're doing that in, in, um, in partnership with Energy Vision in New York and Solar One in New York. And that's pretty exciting. Um, so there's plenty of information out there on what Jody and I are do, doing and what uh, Dr. Thomas H. Colhane is doing what a number of us are working on together. Um, partnerships definitely move things forward. So there's adragonaeroponics.com. Um, she's got her website. She's on Facebook, Adragon Aeroponics. You can go on there and look at some of the beautiful pictures there. Um, Jody and I had done a TED Talk called Home Scale Biodigester. Uh, you may have noticed I am a stutterer. So it's very, very hard to get me to do any kind of public speaking, much less record it. But it is there, and we did it, and we're very proud of it. And it's, um, it's gone quite far in the world, a lot farther than we ever thought. And uh, if you want to see some of our videos, there is a video tour of uh, my home and Jody's home. And that's on youtube.com slash solar cities. I highly recommend that you visit that because it gives you a lot of answers, uh, a lot of detailed answers. And uh, our nonprofit website, if you choose to check us out, or if you wish to make a donation as well, we could use your support. We are small uh, but mighty. Um, we're at solarcities.solutions. Um, our Facebook page for the nonprofit is Solar Cities. And if you want to see what people are doing around the world, it's really, really impressive. I mean, to see people from um, people from universities to um, these young men that we're working with in, you know, in a refugee camp, though what they're doing is amazing. Um, so visit Solar Cities Biogas Innoventors and Practitioners. And we have our ver very first downloadable book. We made it a downloadable PDF because people all around the world were begging us to please put out something with instructions on how to build these little IBC tank biodigesters. So we worked on it and we put it out and it's called How to Build a Solar Cities IBC Tank Biodigester. So it is out there if anyone is interested. We do workshops as well. Jody and I travel just about anywhere to teach people how to do this. And there is our contact information. And that is all I have for you. And we can go on to Q&A. <laughs> Janice, thank you so much. Um, so we'll turn it over to Chuck and Joe with some questions and also probably open it to the floor for uh, questions that people might want to ask directly. OK, well, the first question that we have is what material are the plant wall panels made of? And is it chemically inert? Yes, we use a food grade plastic, which is what they use in restaurants for storage containers and all things that pertain to the food service industry. So they are non-chemical emitting. They are very expensive because they are food grade plastic. And the next question is, what are the functions of the electric, the AC-DC current in the grow walls? Is it heat? Is it light? Are LEDs used? I simply use the electricity in the walls themselves to run the pump, to pump the water from the bottom reservoir to the top so that it can cascade over the back of the plants. I also use it for the grow lights, and that is it. Chuck, do you want to take the next one? Um, I'm having a little bit. So it is a, it's the biodigester, an ongoing process that generates fuel and clean water, or is it batch? And yeah, we don't do batch. It's a, it's a through process, so it's continuously going through. And I store the uh, biodigestate in a container, and then we can move it from container to container. 
But can I follow up and ask what's the resonance time then if it's continuous? Isn't it take days to do the digestion? Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. Um, so it's a very slow flow rate. It's a slow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, what we with this kind of biodigester, because not, it's not tubular, a tubular biodigester makes a really thick slurry. It's a it's an undigested, um, you know, slurry. Large. Yeah, it's and what we get with these um, more vertical systems is we get the sludge that's staying down at the bottom and we've got the floating material at the top. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a practitioner. So I'm probably not the best to answer any of the scientific stuff. But what we're finding is we've got this layering effect. We don't stir. It doesn't stir. So we've got solids at the bottom. We've got the, the oils at the top. And in the center is where we pull our biodigestate from. So what we're seeing is the microbes are actually, you know, digesting at the top and the bottom, and then everything's going towards the middle. So that's where we're pulling our digestate from. What I typically do for my fertilizer is I, uh, I put it through, I guess you would call it an, uh, an aerobic process. Um, if I'm going to use it as a fertilizer, I will bubble it. I'll put it in bu buckets and literally bubble it. And so I take the ammonia out and, uh, you know, that's how I use it. And Jody's got a big system that she uses for her fields, for her hay. Do you have any idea of what the potassium to sodium ratio is? No, actually, I was discussing that with Jill Clapperton today, and we are going to be sending stuff out to the lab to see what we get. And she said it if we're... It should be within a certain range all the time because we pretty much feed it, you know, what we eat all the time. It's not, um, it's just normal everyday food. Okay. Joe, you want to take the next one? Sure. Are the walls or farm designs for sale somewhere? Yes. You can talk to me about it. Uh, I am right, right now. There's only two wholesale distributors in the US for the large system farm. And I am one of them. The other ones are in Denver. So he's not as easily accessible, unless you live out there, then, then he's out there. But uh, yeah, I, I will always uh, answer questions if anybody has, just email me. Right. That wouldn't be Jack's solar farm by any chance, would it? No, no. Oh, okay. I was just curious because we had he had we had him as a speaker last month. Um, oh, cool. The next the next question is Bill Litvin um, is asking about meat waste or dairy waste. Are, are in those... my in my large system, I my husband just stuffed one of our chickens that died right down through the hole. So we put in um, smaller bones, not huge bones. Uh, we do meat, we do dairy. Uh, it does really like cheese moldy cheese and it really does like cow manure so we get quite a bit of action once we feed it those things but uh, i don't know that jen's puts too many bones in hers but no. I <laughs> no my system's too small so are there more questions from the audience while you're thinking of your questions i will ask another one because i'm really passionate about this subject um you mentioned heat and gas. So if I remember my biogas 101 and biodigestion, there's a strong temperature dependence and you need to keep the digester warm. And are you providing that heat from the digest from the digestion process? Janice, you want that one first? Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll feel that one. Um, well, that's exactly what we're doing the research for right now. Um, you know, we live up in a cold climate here in Pennsylvania. My biodigester operates nine months out of the year. But um, one of the reasons we call it a dragon is because it's, it, it's like a reptile. It's the colder it gets, the slower it gets. And then it finally goes to sleep and just hibernates. Um, so we're using the sun to heat ours right now. The, the, uh, the, the research project we have in the backyard has a, uh, some kind of special salt-based insulation around it um, and it has a small greenhouse structure around it so we're working on that if we need to we will add to the tubing that goes around it we will um, start circulating we'll use a um, evacuated tube solar water heater to heat it 
Um, Jody's uh, biodigester is hooked up. She she actually has a cover over hers. Um, hers is in the ground, so it's always the same temperature. So apparently the microbes have adapted. Even the microbes in my system have adapted. They've gotten stronger over the years. Um, but yeah, they, they're heat dependent to keep them running. Jody's runs all year long. Um, she has it set up so she can actually have an on-demand heater that's using the biogas to heat the water that's circulating through the system because she has tubing throughout her entire system. Mm -hmm. okay. The little biodigester that I use all the time is just, just sunshine. So do you do anything to remove the CO2 or increase the BTUs? Per um, we, when we do scrub um, the hydrogen sulfide out, we don't do anything with the CO2. We just, we, when we burn our biogas, we've scrubbed the, the, you know, the hydrogen sulfide out, but um, that CO2 is burning carbon neutral. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but it's we also don't, lowering the heating value of the, of the gas. Right. Yeah. So there's some more questions. Is there a significant amount of manual labor associated with operating these home digesters? What do you call significant? Um, I mean, yes, I scrape my plates into a bucket. I carry the bucket out. I pour it into the digester, add the equal amount of water, um, and it does the rest. But I, I don't know. See, we run a farm. So your significant amount of work is probably a lot different than mine. That's what I was going to say. You're asking a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> to me, like it's not a problem either. I, I, I don't, I don't feed mine every day. It would probably function better with a regular meal every day at little bits. Um, but I have a small bucket on my, my counter and every two, three days I'll go out and I have a, uh, I have an insincorator and a work sink outside. So I just throw it through the insincorator to grind it down. So it digests faster because it does digest much faster when you grind it. Um, so I grind it and then I put it in the biodigester and rinse it, you know, I add a little bit of water and then I rinse my bucket out and bring it back in the house. And Kathy and has hers directly from her kitchen sink. So she just grinds right straight through. So yeah, you know, yeah Kathy's like, how much work very, is significant? Yeah, she has very little little work with just grinding hers down the kitchen sink right. and running the water down the drain. That's it. Yep. And then, you know, the gas, the, we have it set up so the gas goes to a gas bag. I have different, I have, we're a proving ground, so we have different types of gas storage here. Um, but uh, most of us have gas bags, so it gas collects in the bag, and then we pull the gas from the bag to the house, to the stove in the house. Okay. Um, if, if we don't want it to produce gas, we stop feeding it. What? What kind of maintenance does it require and how often? And does that put it out of operation for a while doing that maintenance? No, I've, I've had mine for eight years now and they're two IBC tanks. And I have not had to um, empty any of the solids out from the bottom. And that's a, that's, that's a, a very common question. Um, you know, when do you have to clean it out? And I, I don't, I guess if you keep it running, you know, that, and you're not putting the bones and, you know, things that are really hard to digest. Like we don't put lignus material in it because I don't eat lignus material. So, uh, you know, I think these microbes just are able to digest quite a bit of, uh, you know, quite a bit of this food and they do it pretty rapidly and they get stronger my, over my, the years. My question, yeah, my question yeah. is always, how often do you clean yourself out? Yeah. Your guts <laughs> keep your guts keep digesting every day. Yeah, the only time I've ever had a problem is um, was my fault. Um, if I put something in there that was too acidic, um, you know, and then I had to deal with an acid stomach, basically, you know, and had to go get some bromine <laughs> for an upset stomach. But you know, that, pH that control get... is critical, right? Yeah, pH control is critical, and it, it's it's interesting because I used to test the pH all the time when I first started, and I would get so so nervous about it. And then, you know, it's like raising a baby, um, anybody who's raised a baby, you can tell when, when they, when they, if they smell sour, they, they don't feel good. So you kind of get that from when you're working with the biodigestate, you just get used to it. Like any, 
like any skill at home, like baking bread, you know, if you learn how to bake bread, you're not very good at the beginning, but you just need a lot of practice. And eventually, you know, you just keep making repeatedly making these great loaves of bread. So eight years and still running. I've never cleaned mine out either. I yeah. put a whole lot more stuff in it than John's does. Yeah, now I'm, now I'm, now you're going to make me nervous. I'm going to be waiting for it. I'm going to want to like measure it or something. Or... <laughs> yeah. I did see something about zoning issues. I don't know. I didn't catch the whole question. So whatever that was. Any zoning issues using this in at your house? Uh, we have had, oops, go ahead, Jody. Yeah, I say that that is always a good question because there is no actual zoning rules against it or for it. Most people don't even know what it is. So when it's presented to our township, it's my manure management plan, and they don't have rules against biodigestion or lighting the biogas fuel or anything like that. So uh, at this point, there's nothing out there. I mean, yeah. we've been to Harrisburg talking about this stuff. We still don't have rules against it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not large scale and small scale don't even compare when it comes to safety. You can't walk into these small biodigesters, you know, you, you can walk into the large ones. So they're very dangerous, you know, it can be. The gas that we're using is not under pressure, so it's even safer than propane. Um, we're actually drawing the gas in. Um, if one of our gas bags, um, you know, gets, uh, uh, you know, say somebody punctures it or something and lights it on fire, it's not gonna explode. It's only gonna burn right at that, you know, at the, point that it's uh, expelling. So yeah, we've had people from the township here. We've had, um, well, we've had leg legislators here, yeah, congressmen yep. and representatives come to see what we're doing. And we've had a lot of support. I think you've answered the, oh, I'm sorry. I think he answered the question um, in terms of how the gas is stored or how the biogas is stored. It's stored in bags. We have bags. And I also have, um, I'll, I'll explain what we do is we have, uh, you saw the picture of the IBC tanks, international bulk containers. They're plastic, they're basically a plastic container that's inside of a framework. So I have a, I have biogas storage with two IBC tanks. What I have is the bottom one, I cut off the top and then I inverted a second tank sideways and I cut off what now would be the bottom Okay, and I put that in and then the outlet that sticks up. Now the outlet that's usually on the bottom of the tank is now up. And then I put fittings in there. And then I have, you know, a T. And then I have gas coming from my biodigester in. Okay, so I can close this valve here. And my, my tank will rise up as the gas fills up. And then when I want to draw it out, I just open that, close the other valve. And then I can draw it into the house, or I can draw it into the bag that's outside, or I can draw it into the bag that's in my basement. Is there any kind of safety mechanism regarding building gas pressure? There's really, well, yeah, if you get too much gas, it's going to leak. So you want to, you know, you have to keep an eye on it. It doesn't build up pressure. If you close I'm all your valves, you're going to build up pressure. I'm not Chris and his mom's house. Oh, yeah, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when, you say, uh, when you say you draw the gas, do you have a small vacuum pump or how do you? I, I, have, a, I have a biogas pump. Uh, it's okay. actually manufactured for drawing, you know, the biogas in. Okay. Mine and just uses pressure. And I have a, I also, yeah, and hers is pressure. She has a dome. She has a dome fixture. So that builds up, that does build up pressure. I also have a solar pump as well. It operates on a 12 volt solar panel. Uh, how much, how much wattage is in the, the lights that you use for the vertical farming? What, what kind of watts are those, those lights? They're um, between 60 and 80, depending. I have two different light systems in here right now. The um, newest system only uses 60 watts and the older system uses 80. And that would be one of those big rectangular things that we were seeing. Oh, oh, and you also had that vertical tube. Is that 
the 60 the watt? The tube is the 60 watt, yes. Oh, okay. The, the square um, are the, I guess they did look kind of triangular, but they're actually square. They're the uh, 80 watt. Okay. And they're not as good as the tubular one. I like the less, the less wattage ones best. Hmm. Can you grow like strawberries or tomatoes or just leafy greens? Yes, yes, and yes. I have strawberries in a wall, which I was going to show you, but I can't get my video <laughs> up. Um, I have grown eggplant and uh, peppers and cucumbers and all of, all of those kind of things. I, again, with the lettuce in the same wall as the lettuce. And I also have uh, parsley, sage, rosemary, thyme, sorrel, all those other products, and basil growing right now. We have, a, we have a question. Okay. Can a family of three produce enough waste to produce enough digestate to supply nutrients for the 96 cell system? Ah. How much waste do you produce? So, so you're, you're asking if you can produce enough of the fertilizer for the grow wall. I would imagine you could. Uh, well, most people waste a lot. Yeah, the fertilizer is really concentrated, but let me first say that Jody and I have been experimenting with the fertilizer, and the fertilizer, you still have to use, you know, your regular hydroponic minerals if you're doing commercial sales, <clears throat> because you're not going to get the same growth from the fertilizer, because you're not going to have all of the trace minerals. Yeah, that's they're talking we're, small. Right, that's... That's why we're working with Jill Clapperton so that we can get everything tested to see just how much we would actually have to add in trace minerals in order to have optimal growth. But I do find that if I use the um, biodigestate in the small one, if I add uh, Epsom salts and sometimes a little bit of pH up, it works pretty well. And again, I have the larger system, so mine is almost clear. There's not sludge in it. Like, uh, I don't have too many fines either. It's, it's mostly just clear liquid. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that takes fine tuning when you're using the biodigestate, for sure. Right. And, and Jody, has, Jody has tested a number of products that she really likes that helps to supplement it. So there's a, there's a huge thank you here. Fascinating talk. Thanks for this. Is there a video available afterwards? And I think that, Phil, maybe you can address that. Yeah, we'll, we'll post all the links that uh, Janice listed on her uh, presentation so we can be sure that's available on the website for people to look at. As well as the video of this presentation, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and that would be on YouTube? Uh, the presentation will be on YouTube, but you'll have the link, all the links will be on the, our website and, and uh, just be a little patient. It uh, takes a little while to get it up there and then, it, and then to get access to it. Um, so within the next day or so. There was one more question we had, um, if I can, it was, what is the lifespan of those containers? Uh, I'm assuming the you know, RBC. To tell you the truth, uh, you want the, the container as like the shipping container and my whole operation or just the wall itself? It has a 10 year warranty. I'm assuming it's a wall, the wall. Okay, the wall has, it has a 10 year warranty. Uh, I have been running them continuously for the last three years. And I, I don't give them a break. I, because I run year round, they run year round. I only took down uh, a couple of times. I'll take one down to completely clean it out, but that's only a couple of days and then it's up and running again. Is there any humidity control in the, in the, in the growing area? Oh, yeah. I use the um, heat and air conditioning system. It has the humidity control in it, but I find because the lights are such low wattage, they don't give off heat. I can put my hands right on the lights that have been running for three years and they don't, they're not hot. So I don't create heat, so I don't create humidity. 
So there, that has not been an issue. Plus with the coating in the large system here, uh, I don't get the mold on the walls or anything like that. So I really don't have that issue. And you're using much less water. Oh, absolutely, uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Where in a hydroponic system, you might, you might start with 40 or 50 gallons of water. I start with 15 and in the, the newest system, it uses such little water but in an eight-week growth cycle, I might add four gallons, maybe. Wow. Okay, we have some more questions. Um, you mentioned aerating the digestate to remove ammonia or ammonium. I think it's ammonia gas, right? Is there any reason why you have to remove it? Um, it's just what's in the uh, what's in the fertilizer, the liquid fertilizer. Um. So Ammonium is water soluble, right? Ammonia has yeah. solubility in water. So yeah. I'm not sure which the, the questioner is asking about, but they're two very different things. Right. Well, there's an ammonia smell, and that's what I get out. <laughs> yeah. We are not scientists. I told you we're not scientists. Yeah, that would be that would be Dr. Cole Hain and he, he that's another thing you want to analyze hours. for you actually want to analyze yeah. the ammonia content that would yep. that would actually be useful yep I've got a whole list for my homework today okay I rely on scientists to tell me what to do to teach me what I need to know but then you share it with the world which is absolutely really, absolutely really admirable are there any other questions from the audience Going once. Um, I have one more question about the lighting for the aeroponics. Is is that something you have a, like a normal day associated with it, or do you keep the lights on all the time? Uh, there's some debate on that. I personally have been running the lights 24 hours a day for the last three years. Um, oh. I find that my growth is substantial. Every week I get eight, well, between six and nine cuttings from every lettuce plant. I have some uh, parsleys that are two years old now, have been continuously producing and being harvested for the last two years. So I don't see any problem with running them 24-7. Um, the scientists say you need to turn them off for a minimum of eight hours. Yep, that's but, what Jill was um, saying today. Yep. I don't, I don't see the value in it. Hmm, interesting. Go ahead, try and do it and write a paper. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, there's another there's, another another question here. How many years to break even? Make a profit from your crops considering the high cost of the wall and other materials needed? Because I'm running and I'm harvesting as a small product. So basically I sell um, the smaller lettuce. They're not really small, but uh, I don't cut full heads, so I don't have to wait the 12 weeks. I start harvesting after five, and the ROI on my system with seven walls and appropriate lights for um, eight lights per wall, I have an ROI of a year and a half. Great. Um, another question, have you talked to NASA about this? NASA, N-A-S-A, is that? Yes. Bill, you want to chime in here? Yeah, NASA, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space. What does? Oh, oh, because of the food. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, to like build this on the space station or something. Yeah, well, yeah, we actually Joey, Jody and I signed an NDA with a company with um, yeah. lots of representatives from NASA. Well, um, we talk about it. <laughs> So, yeah, that's, it, it wouldn't be our system. It's somebody else's system, but we have, we have consulted on it. Would you consider your system an organic food system? Absolutely. It's actually beyond organic. There you go. You know yeah, Jody, I did, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't cover what you uh, actually use for your grow medium. I know. Um, it's a little beyond organic uh, because... We don't have inorganic material or, yeah. The problem with that is that we can't get a certification from 
or the organic farming certification, it, one, it's too expensive. I don't see the need for it. And they do allow a certain amount of foreign chemicals that would be airborne that you wouldn't know about. Uh, I don't have a problem because I'm enclosed. Nothing gets in here except what I bring in. So we are definitely organic, even without the certification. Um, the produce is much, much better tasting and we're pretty sure it's a lot more nutritious than what they're growing outside these days. So, um, yeah. Jo Jody's, Jody's using cocoa core for her grow medium and cow pots to hold the cocoa core. And she's also using, um, you know, natural, uh, natural pesticides. <laughs> Ladybugs, yes. <laughs> ladybugs and other healthy critters. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. So we have one. Aphid wasps and things like that. So do you need pests? Do you need critters? Are there pests from somewhere? When we have tours, because I. I oh, we bring them in on our clothes. Yes. Oh. I live next to her and I'm sort of in the middle of our hay field with my grow, so anytime, a lot of people are in here, they come in just opening and closing the door and on people's clothes and stuff. So yes, I do find uh, the ladybugs usually take care of um, whatever pests I have inside. Okay. So do so, you, you bring you bring in ladybugs and-, and I do, yes. Uh, we do hatch some out. Unfortunately, um, I don't usually have enough time to shake off all of the ladybugs off the produce, so occasionally they ride home with other people. <laughs> so um, there is one pushback from one of our attendees saying that dark periods in plants help stimulate flowering. And um, um, I wish I had my video up. I have one, no, two. Um, nasturtium plants right now with about 180 flowers on the two of them. So I don't know that I need more flowering. Okay. Um, I don't generally flower my lettuce or my herbs. So um, yeah, I've, I've heard that too, but I really don't find it to be necessarily true. We have um, a small experiment with cannabis and they ran 24 hours for a while, and then when they were ready for flower, yes, they did do it that way. But um, for what I'm growing, I don't really need to flower. Okay. Then um, one of our Adon is asking, what can you not put in a digester? What cannot be used in the digester? So no, number one, number one would be grass. lignus material. Lignus yeah, material. That's... So no straw, no dry grass, no. Um, you know, sticks and twigs. Yeah, sticks and twigs. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love Jody's answer. No sticks and twigs. Uh, toothpicks. You know, like if, if you don't swallow it yourself, don't put it in there. Uh, yeah, that's I, that's our rule of thumb. Yeah, that's for the small one. For the large one, I don't put wood and things like that in there, but I do put bones and uh, big chunks of pig fat when we slaughter. I'm sorry. We do the, um, so there, you know, there's things that we put in our big one that Janice does not put in hers. So how, mine's how 10 often, times bigger. How often do you have to add microorganisms or manure? I add manure pretty regularly because I have cows. So when we clean the barn, it goes in there. So um, I don't think Janice does not very much unless it's I sour. just, I, I boost in the springtime. But um, yeah, I didn't do that at all with my with my old biodigester this year. I usually just boost it in the springtime. But so the bugs are pretty much concentrated, stable over multiple months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just go to sleep in the winter. And in, in mine, yeah. wow, mine just slows by about half. Um, I get about half the amount of gas in the dead of winter ones really cold but otherwise it, it just chugs along all year but I mean, we, we, we you know, never we're always excited about this it's just it's craziness that you can I mean, we've been gardeners and farmers all our lives and 
who knew? I didn't know that you could do this at home. I've heard of biodigesters, but it's the industrial scale biodigesters. And when we saw this for the first time, our minds were just blown that you could, you know, have a yeah. tank in your back. You have a tank of water in your backyard, basically, and produce and, fuel. And the industrial biodigesters that produce biogas are, are very sensitive to temperature. I mean, they are maintained isothermally to, you know, maintain the production. And it's not ambient temperature. It's 70, 80 degrees C. Mm -hmm. So we're, it, we're, we're actually, we're actually working with a fellow who's working on a project in Pennsylvania, and he's actually looking to partner with a university on this. It's the major multi-million dollar project that's going to be funded hmm. through the infrastructure fund. Well, and, we have uh, another, oh, go ahead. So we're, we're looking for any, if, if anybody is doing that kind of research, if anybody's interested in getting into some really interesting large scale, it's not, it's not typical large scale biodigestion, but if anybody's interested, they can give me a call. So we have one more question. Can you put soap in the digester or not? Can you put soap? If you're putting in just a normal actual soap and not a detergent, yes. So you have to be careful. If you're going to hook this up to your kitchen sink and grind your food waste and you, you do dishes and everything, you want to make sure you're using like an organic soap. It can tolerate a little bit of soap just like you and I can. We have another one. For Jody to turn on the video on her iPad, tap any place on the screen, <laughs> and a menu bar should appear at the top you will see an option to start video. Oh, for Pete's sake. Why didn't somebody tell me? There I am. Somebody Yay! Tell me like, <laughs> All right, so here we go. Yay, finally, right? So this is, this is not even the really good stuff. Um, I'll stand up. So we run top. Don't hurt yourself. Um, no, no, I, I'm fine. Down to the bottom. You can see I've got some, these, these are delicious, they're frills. John is going to attest to that. She loves oh, them. I love the frills, they're amazing. So there's, this. and then, what the lights look like. This is, um, now some of, you guys have to know I broke my hip, so some of my drawers are not planted out because I've not been in here for the last month, so. I'm going to step through. Take your time. I did. So here's my parsley. And then I have um, cutting celery, which is, this is really, really old stuff. So it's getting to the point where I have new in the other, other container. I don't know if you guys like sorrel. Anyway, I'll show you. This is what I want you to see. These are the craziness of the nursery. And they run 24 hours a day. So you see all the, the blossoms all over. I harvest probably 50 blossoms off every week. And I save seeds from these guys so that I new plants from them. And then back here is the tubular lights. You can see they're much brighter. And that's the um, lettuce colors and stuff from them. So this is what we do. And I've got you know, some uh, other lettuce. These guys here are, uh, as you can see, they've been harvested a good bit here. So they, these are on their a seventh week of being harvested. So they're about on now. But you can see the growth on them is substantial for just a week. Yeah, this we're, is a week's we're, worth of growth. Yeah, we're seeing um, that, you know, they'll bolt, but they, the taste is fine. You know, usually when a, a plant bolts, yeah. like your lettuce, it's bitter. But that's not happening because of these lights. How are you adding the nutrient? Right. How are you adding the water that contains the nutrient? Right. Uh, I have a little, um, a little uh, hatch right here. And my granddaughters didn't clean this. One. So it, the water, we put water in here. This is where I test uh, pHs and stuff down here in this little hole. And then there's a a uh, reservoir that runs the length of the wall and sticks out the bottom. And that's where the original 15 gallons of water goes in, down at the bottom of the wall. 
and then you pump it up to the top. Correct. Yes. I have the other door open. So like the other slide, I'll show you um, the interior. I have the door open where I started out. Oh, this would be good to be able to do this to begin with. Bring this guy out of my way. So um, this is where we... So we can do the bottom here, the pump it goes all to the top through and then cascades over the back of the plants. So all the water will run down the troughs and they'll hit. And you can see um, these are some of the plants I showed you on the other side, the sorrel and everything that's been growing. It keeps the roots very compact inside the cups so I don't lose a lot of uh, water dripping off the roots and we don't waste growth on roots. And I also don't have the slough. A lot of times the hydroponic growers will have a bunch of clogging going in their pumps because of the root systems on the plants. Now what you're, what Jody's showing you right now is the, the original design that, that yeah. we work I'm, with. I'm gonna walk over. I have a panel, Jody, right in my hands and I can oh, show okay, them the new panel. So the newer ones that you saw, they're, they're modular. So they put together a bunch of these, right, to make different size walls. Mm -hmm. And then it looks the same on the, the outside. But then on the inside, you'll see how they've created it. So the water cascades yeah. down onto each plant. So it's got a yeah. nice little path to follow. Yeah. So this, is, this is, again, we want to save water. We want to use it yeah. to the, uh, very efficiently. Yeah. So that's it. That's neat. And they click together. See, they just got dull. It's like putting together Legos. <laughs> so it's similar to an it's NFT system, just like vertical. This Sorry, is the evolution of. What'd you say, Mike? I was saying, so it's almost like an uh, NFT, a nutrient film transfer thing, except vertically, which is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, it sounds like there's a notable difference in the taste and flavor and what's grown? Yes, absolutely. I have one customer who um, she started midwinter and loved everything that we were doing. She's been coming for CSA for quite a while. She went on vacation in California and <laughs> called me when she got back and said, I have to come back. I'm a, I'm a lettuce snob now. Lettuce tastes terrible. <laughs> in California, it tastes terrible. And so that was fresher than what you can get at Walmart or anything here. My lettuce literally will last two weeks in the refrigerator without finishing it. So that could keep it for two weeks. The scientific version of that is how the nutritional values of your plants compared analytically to the nutritional value of outside farm plants. Uh, we haven't tested head to head. Um, I've only done the um, the little. Uh, where you squeeze the juice out, but that's more of a test for water content, which mine's much higher than anything you can get from outside. But I'm, I'm waiting for Jill to be ready yeah. to test the actual new trial. And she wasn't quite ready yet. So when she's ready, we'll do that. Yeah, she's she's almost done setting up her laboratory in Boston. She, she just moved. Yeah. Well, right. We're glad we, to have her here on the East Coast now. We have a... We yeah, have she's a more, <laughs> We have a couple of attendees that want to know where they can go to actually see this setup. Do oh, you, they want to see the systems? Jody uh, does tours. The only one that, I, yeah, we do tours here at Azure Bunny Aeroponics. We are in Pennsylvania. Where in Pennsylvania? Um, we are about halfway between Town and Westchester, just off Route 100 on 401. Okay. One more is our address, but we're in Ludwig's Corner. Okay. So Don, you, it's not, not too far away. We bring two water though. Have to stop warning sign. The app must be running in the background to receive alarms. Tap to reopen the app, critical, Gmail. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Any more, any more questions, people? 
Oh, Joe, do you have any other questions? That's all I that's all I see. Okay. That's all I have. Yeah, if you want to schedule if you want to schedule a tour with Jody or and me, um, you know, give Jody a call. Just share her contact information. Do you want to share that again? Janice? Oh, if anybody wants to uh, schedule a tour, they do have to be scheduled. Please don't just show up. Um, give Jody a call. Um, like I said, we're only a mile apart, so you could actually see both sites at the same time if you wished. Okay, great. All right, well, people can look for that on the website. We'll post all that information. And um, we want to thank you very much, both of you, for a wonderful presentation and lots of fun. Well, thanks so, for uh, having us. We really appreciate it. We, we love sharing what we do. Yeah. Janice is on Font Road, literally a mile from my house. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you and good luck with everything and um, wonderful project. Take care and we'll, we'll yes, look forward to seeing you very much. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. Good night. All right. All right. Good, good night. night. We'll look forward to seeing you at the last Tuesday of next month when we get into solar technology. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Have a good night.